I'd like to explain to you that uh, this is not actually exactly thermodynamics and neither is it exactly kinetics. So if I uh, change to the next slide here, uh, this is uh, what we call stable equilibrium that if I give this uh, ball uh, an infinite decimal perturbation, it will come back to its original location. This clearly is not equilibrium because a ball is rolling down this nonlinear hill and therefore it's uh, dissipating free energy as it rolls down. Now the difference between this and this is that this is a steady state process because we have a constant gradient here. So if I'm an observer located on this ball, I actually won't see any change happening even though free energy is being dissipated. So the thermodynamics of irreversible processes is strictly about the steady state processes. For example, you know, if we have a, a bar with um, the temperature at one end being hot and the other end being uh, cold, and there's a constant gradient of temperature, then at any location within that bar, you will see the same temperature, even though heat is flowing down that bar. So this is a, a, a subject which is between kinetics and thermodynamics. And whereas uh, in equilibrium, you know, we can write an equation that G alpha equals G gamma at equilibrium, in both of these cases, that becomes an inequality because we are actually dissipating free energy. So G alpha may be less than G gamma in both of these cases. Okay, um, just to uh, remind you of the meaning of a reversible process and an irreversible process, because you know the title of this talk has the term irreversible. Uh, if I have a cylinder here containing an ideal gas and there is no friction between the piston and the gas, then if I start to increase the pressure along this curve, then the volume will decrease. And then when I reverse the process, it will go exactly back along that line. So in this process of going there and coming back in this cyclic process, there is no free energy dissipated. You recover all the energy that you put in. In contrast, in this case, if I want to decrease volume because I have friction between the piston and the cylinder, I will have to increase the pressure until the friction is overcome and then follow this uh, path here where the volume decreases as the pressure increases. And when I uh, start to reduce the pressure, Again, to overcome the friction, I'll have to go to a much lower pressure than given by the blue curve and so on until I get back to the original point and the free energy dissipated in this process is the area within this uh, red loop. So process like this is called irreversible because entropy is being created during that process. Uh, and we can express this in the following way. So uh, let's assume that J is some kind of a flux, okay? It could be a heat flux and X is a generalized force uh, which is driving that heat flow. Then the product of uh, the flux and the force is equal to the temperature times the rate of entropy production. In other words, the rate of energy dissipation in an isothermal process. Uh, J here is a generalized flux. It could be a heat flux, it could be a diffusion flux or an electrical current, for example. And this is the force which drives that flux. And if I can write an equation like this, where the temperature multiplied by the, by the rate of entropy production uh, which is basically the free energy dissipation rate at an isothermal temperature, then it will equal to the product of the flux and the force if you have expressed these relations properly. In other words, uh, you know, in, a, in the case of a diffusion flux, this would not be a concentration gradient, but a chemical potential gradient. So S dot, is a, S dot is the rate of entropy production, generalized flux and generalized force. Now, 
the importance of this equation is that if I can write such an equation, then we generally find that the flux is proportional to the force, okay? So if I go to the um, next bit, if we can express the forces and flux says in terms of the free energy dissipation rate, then we find that the flux is proportional to the force. And I'll give you examples. So here, here is the um, Ohm's law representation where we have a potential difference given by this battery. There's a current flowing, and this is a resistor which resists the flow of the current. And you know it's obvious that if I multiply the current by the voltage, I get a free energy dissipation rate, yeah? because that, that's the energy that's dissipated. And therefore, we find that the current is proportional to the potential difference, V. And that, of course, gives us our Ohm's law with one upon R being the proportionality constant. Okay. So this satisfies what we said in the last slide that if I can write an equation in which I express the energy dissipation rate as a product of a force and a flux, then the current will be proportional to, uh, then the flux will be proportional to the force. And in this particular case of Ohm's law, um, the proportionality constant is one upon R. Now, if you look at uh, heat transfer as the second example, uh, I've got these two chambers which are at different temperatures, TH and TL, and the area here is uh, A, and we are transferring a quantity of heat DH in, into this side. Now, from an earlier lecture, you know that the entropy change on doing this transfer is one upon the lower temperature minus one upon the higher temperature. In other words, we have actually produced entropy because the higher temperature is smaller than the lower temperature. And the rate of entropy production is simply ds by dt, and this is per, per unit volume, uh, which we can uh, expand by substituting for ds here. So it's dH by dt into one upon TL minus one upon TH. And therefore the rate of entropy production is equal to a flux. Uh, this is the relationship between the flux going through a unit area and dH dt. So if I take A onto this side, then that flux will be per unit area and this is dH dt. Uh, so I've substituted now for dH dt by the product of the flux and the area. And that is, uh, if you make these uh, temperature differences small enough, then that is the flux into minus one upon t squared dt by dz, where z is uh, coordinate in this direction. And therefore the temperature, if I take one of these temperature terms onto this side, then the temperature times the rate of entropy production gives us the heat flux. And this is the correctly expressed force that is driving the heat flux. Now, you might, you might be a little bit confused here because normally we say heat flux depends on the temperature gradient, but that would not be consistent with this equation. It actually depends on one upon minus one upon T times the temperature gradient. So if you go back to um, the heat flow equation of Fourier, where you know the flux is proportional to the temperature gradient, and this is a thermal conductivity, K really is a function of temperature. It's not a, not a constant, okay? So um, this equation here tells us that J is proportional to this entire product here, and therefore, you know, if we take Fourier's law, then the conductivity will have a temperature dependence. Now, the temperature dependence actually depends on the mechanism by which the heat is transferred, but it should be temperature dependent. And that comes uh, directly from that uh, equation where we said that if I can write a product of T times S dot equals J times X, then J will be proportional to X. As long as X is expressed correctly so that the product of J and X gives us a rate of uh, 
energy dissipation. Okay, um, this is a story which I might already have uh, explained uh, that fixes law of diffusion, where you know the flux is proportional to a concentration gradient and the proportionality constant is a diffusion coefficient d. We know that um, it shouldn't be the case that it's proportional to the concentration gradient in general, because when we look at circumstances like these, where we have two phases in equilibrium, but with different compositions, there is a concentration gradient, but we will not get a flux because the chemical potentials of the species are uniform, even though the chemical compositions are different. So diffusion is actually driven by a chemical potential gradient. So if you look at this free energy curve here, and we have in the same sample, we have two regions with different chemical composition, then the chemical potentials are clearly different in those two regions. The free energies are clearly different. And therefore, there will be a driving force for diffusion and which will tend to homogenize this material given, given sufficient time and thermal activation. And uh, we demonstrated that by writing Fix's law and by uh, writing another law which says J is proportional to the gradient of chemical potential. And because this is per unit concentration, we also multiply by the concentration here. And this is now our proportionality constant and if I expand that a little bit to express it like this, where it's d mu by dc and dc by dz equal to d mu by dz, then we have the analogy with uh, the diffusion coefficient, that the diffusion coefficient actually is a function of how the chemical potential changes with concentration. And m is what we call a mobility. And sometimes we use a symbol capital L for for mobility and sometimes a capital M, doesn't matter. Okay, so diffusion is uh, driven by a chemical potential gradient, not by, uh, not in general by a concentration gradient. And just to summarize what we've done so far, um, you know, in the case of electrical current, we had the voltage which was driving the um, current and that's uh, basically an expression for the electromotive force. Uh, heat flux minus one upon T into the gradient of temperature and diffusion flux, the gradient of free energy. And of course, if you are deforming something plastically, then the product of stress and strain rate is actually the free energy dissipation rate. And therefore, you know, you will find the strain rate to be proportional to the stress. Of course, there will be complications, for example, work hardening and so forth, but let's assume we have a perfectly plastic solid. So I haven't actually explained to you so far why, you know, if we write an equation, which is T times S dot equals J times X, then why does J turn out to be proportional to X? So I'm going to explain that uh, empirically now. So, this is the flux, and when I use these curly brackets, I mean that J is a function of X. This is not a product of J and X. And I'm going to expand this J in terms of X uh, as a polynomial. So the first term here, second term, third term, where here there is a direct dependence on the force and on the square of the force and, and so on. Now, if you look at this equation carefully, uh, this term, has to be zero because there's no flux when there is no force, okay? So we can delete that. And as an approximation, I'm going to ignore all the terms which are in higher order of X. So if you do that, then your flux becomes proportional to the force, okay? So this also emphasizes another, another point that this theory can only apply when there aren't large forces, okay? So we're talking about relatively small forces. Now, the obvious question to ask is how large does the force have to be before this stops applying? And the answer is that you simply have to do an experiment to see whether 
your original hypothesis that j is proportional to x works or not. There is no rigorous way of telling you that, look, when x is of this magnitude, the proportionality between the force and flux will disappear. And I once asked a physicist uh, whether Ohm's law is satisfied when the potential difference is very large. The answer is very difficult in that case because you also get heating of the sample if you have a very large current. But I will show you another example now where clearly the proportionality between force and flux breaks down when you go to large forces. Okay? And this is a, an example which will be familiar to you and it's about uh, grain boundary motion. Okay, so let's assume that this is one crystal here, gamma, and uh, this is just because the lattice is periodic, so we have these potential wells corresponding to the periodicity. And this is the crystal alpha, which has a lower free energy, so gamma is tending to transform into alpha. And there is an activation barrier in the transfer of atoms in the austenite into the ferrite, and this delta G is the driving force. Now, in any, any reaction, there will be a forward flux and a reverse flux, okay? So the forward flux will be proportional to the Arrhenius term, including the activation barrier, G star, okay? So it's proportional to exponential of minus G star upon RT. And the reverse flux has a larger activation barrier, which is the sum of G star and the magnitude of the driving force. So G star and the magnitude of driving force. And the velocity of your interface should be proportional to the difference between these two quantities here, the forward flux and the reverse flux. So I'm now going to substitute for these terms using these identities. And then you get the velocity is proportional to exponential minus g star upon rt into this because one times that is simply that and this times this is this, okay? So you find the velocity is not directly proportional to the driving force. So this looks like it violates the principle that t s dot equals jx, then j is proportional to x. So this is a, a physically derived equation which ought to work for any magnitude of the driving force. But if you look at the maths of this expression, and you can show this for yourself, when delta G is small, this whole term becomes magnitude of delta G over RT, and we recover the relationship between the velocity and the driving force, a direct proportionality, okay? So how small? Well, you can try and use this equation and substitute values of delta G and see what deviation you get between these two relationships that the velocity directly proportional to this or using this sort of an equation, okay? So this illustrates that um, you need to be careful when looking at very large forces. And this was one of the problems that I discussed when I gave the seminar at IIT Kharagpur that when we deal with diffusion in very steep gradients, uh, we can no longer assume um, that there isn't an additional cost, which is greater than just the chemical potential gradient, okay? Okay, here I'll give you another example, which may be closer to home, that um, is in the context of steel making. Now, you might recognize this person here. Okay, uh, this is uh, what's known as uh, Linz Donowitz converter, and it's located uh, in Austria. And, you know, the Bessemer process was able to produce steel, but it contained quite a lot of uh, phosphorus, which is quite difficult to eliminate. But by blowing uh, oxygen at high pressure in this converter, you can actually reduce the phosphorus content uh, using also a, a slag of lime into which the uh, lime and dolomite, dolomite is a magnesium oxide, um, 
into which the phosphorus partitions. Okay, so this this is uh, uh, a really good technology which made all the difference to the mechanical properties of steels in the old days. Okay. Okay. So again, uh, if you look at the transport between the slag and the metal interface. Uh, we can use the same sort of analysis as we did in this case, where we look at a forward reaction between the slag and the metal and a reverse from the metal to the slag. And that is the origin of this uh, equation, uh, where you look at the flux of an iron across the slag metal interface. And this is the driving force, the Faraday times the valency times an over potential. And obviously this has units of energy because it's the same units as RT. And in, you know, this uh, subscript I is actually for many components, uh, not just phosphorus. So you, you have uh, many elements in the slag and you might have many elements in the metal as well. Uh, so if you want to develop a model for this process, it's difficult using these highly nonlinear equations. But by applying irreversible thermodynamics, you can simplify something like this, uh, assuming that the approximation is adequate to a more or less linear equation like this, where you know the rate of the reaction uh, across the slag metal interface is directly proportional to this driving force, exactly as in irreversible thermodynamics. So this paper here that uh, I got this information from is basically about applying irreversible thermodynamics to slag metal interfaces. But the principle is the same as we discussed for the grain boundary, where you look at the forward reaction rate and the reverse reaction rate. So this method is actually extremely powerful and extremely helpful in many circumstances where the driving forces are not very large. It's, it's actually quite rare that we have very large driving forces because for example, in the case of transformations in steel, you would have to undercool a lot in order to get a large driving force. And that makes it difficult to maintain the particular mechanism of transformation that operates at a high temperature. So it's, it's very difficult to actually super cool things uh, to provide this very large driving force. So in general, the theory will work rather nicely. Now comes the really interesting bit, okay? Where if I asked you how a thermocouple works, uh, you would have to think because nowadays we take thermocouples for granted. But it's really strange, you know, you've got a temperature difference between a reference and the electrode you are using to sense the temperature. And that temperature difference creates a voltage. Okay. So it's, it's strange. We have a temperature difference creating a voltage. And there's also the opposite effect. I think it's called the Peltier effect, where if I apply a potential difference, I also create, if I pass a current between a potential difference, I also create a temperature difference. So obviously, you know, there is a link between the force that's driving the diffusion of heat, okay, in your thermocouple, and the creation of a potential difference. And this is very easy to handle in the framework of irreversible thermodynamics because the equation we had where we multiply uh, temperature by the rate of entropy production equal to a flux times a force, we can generalize to any number of combinations of forces and fluxes, okay? So this remains the same. This is the rate of entropy production. I'll just use a different symbol here. Uh, I should correct that. Um, so this could be, you know, a heat flux and the force driving the heat flux. And then you could have another term, which is a flux of uh, matter driving uh, 
driven by um, chemical potential difference. And if you can write this equation that the net free energy dissipation rate is due to a variety of forces and fluxes, then you can also say, just as we said, J is proportional to X, we can say that J will be proportional to this, where you know repeated indices imply a summation. So I could, for example, have the flux of one depending not only on the force of one, but also on the force of something else. For example, the temperature gradient, and this could be the potential difference. And similarly, J2 will be a function not only of X1, but also of X2. So a force can affect the flux of something else uh, exactly as in a thermocouple or in the Peltier effect. Now, supposing the system is at equilibrium. Okay, so you've got an interface uh, between the slag and the metal and the system is at equilibrium. Equilibrium is not static. You know, you get atoms jumping in both directions at an equal rate. And that is a dynamic equilib equilibrium. So that principle tells us uh, that, you know, at equilibrium, the rates of forward and reverse reactions must be the same. So these two terms here must be identical. Okay, M12 must be equal to M21. And that applies, uh, you know, however long these equations are, that Mij will be equal to Mji. And this is called the principle of microscopic reversibility. The only exceptions would be, for example, you know, where you have a magnetic field, because there is actually a sign of the magnetic field which comes into play, in which case Mij will be equal to minus Mji. But we don't normally, um, well, I mean, physicists use this a lot, but in materials, we are mostly interested in this part where we have microscopic reversibility and m 21 is really equal to M12. If there's an M31, it will be equal to M13 and so on. So that simplifies things a little bit. And I mentioned to you that um, we have uh, diffusion coefficient strictly depending on how the chemical potential varies with the concentration. And this is for a binary system. Okay. If I have a ternary system where I have the host, uh, we'll call it with a substrate three and two solutes, X1 and X2, then without going into detail, the detail is in this review that I did uh, some time ago. And also in many publications of the people who actually did this work, all the references are in there, but I don't want you to worry about that at all. But we have to write then the diffusion coefficient as a function of how the chemical potential of one varies with its concentration. And, uh, yep, that's, uh, this is the cross diffusion coefficient, but this is the solvent, okay? And L12 is the interaction between the first solute and the second solute. So the diffusion coefficient of one will also depend on how the chemical potential of solute two varies with concentration. So for example, if I have a bar which has a uniform carbon concentration, but it has a gradient of manganese, then given a chance, the carbon will also develop a gradient driven by the gradient of manganese, the free energy gradient of manganese, okay? Now these coefficients uh, are incorporated in, these are mobility coefficients like M, okay? And they are incorporated in databases which are commercially available. So for example, when you do a calculation using a program like Dictra, okay? You are accessing matrices of mobility coefficients, which have been worked out by many, many people and compiled into a database. So in many cases, these mobility coefficients are actually available, including the cross terms, okay? 
Now I'm going to show you an experiment which was conducted in 1982 in which you take a, a bar of uh, steel, which is about, uh, I think, three centimeters long, water-cooled at both ends, but heated resistively. So you develop a temperature peak in the middle. And the bar, to begin with, is completely homogeneous. Uh, it has a homogeneous distribution of carbon. But when you do the experiment, uh, because there is this uh, temperature gradient and heat flow, you get carbon building up in the middle. So this, these are direct experimental measurements showing the effect of a heat flux on carbon diffusion. Okay, So we started off with a homogeneous concentration, but by building this temperature gradient, water cooled at the ends and resistively heated, so the temperature peaks in the middle, the carbon redistributes driven by the heat flux. So this is, these are real effects and they do uh, influence the processing of steels, et cetera, if you have gradients in your material. To summarize then, uh, we often think of a force and flux as uniquely related, but if you have several forces that can influence that particular flux, then they will all come into play. And that's how a thermocouple works. And that's how the various examples that I've given you um, also can be formalized in terms of the theory of irreversible thermodynamics, where clearly there are some approximations which you can only demonstrate uh, whether they are correct or not using experimental methods.